bon anniversaire. Uh, I'm kind of envious because I turned 60 in July 2020 and there was no way to organize anything. <laughs> <in there>. So, <laughs> um, okay, a lot of things are happening uh, in AI today and I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk about um, sort of uh, interesting avenues to make AI even more impressive than, than it's been over the last few months and, and then, you know, point out the limitations of uh, what's uh, happening. So machine learning sucks. It really sucks. At least <laughs> if we compare it to what humans and animals can do. Um, uh, I mean, our ability to learn things really quickly, um, to um, figure out how the world works, mostly by observation when we're babies, um, is amazing. And we cannot reproduce this with machines today. Despite all the hypes that you hear, we don't know how to do it. Um, so obviously, supervised learning has been you know, widely successful for a lot of uh, applications. Reinforcement learning has kind of limited success, uh, mostly in uh, games and things like that, uh, because it requires insane amounts of uh, trials. Um, and what's taken over the world over the last few years is something called self-supervised learning, which I say a few words about. Uh, but in the end, we still have systems that are specialized, somewhat brittle. Um, they make stupid mistakes. Uh, they do not reason and plan, at least very few of them do. Uh, if we compare this to humans and most animals, um, uh, they can learn new tasks extremely quickly, understand how the world works, uh, reason and plan, and have some level of common sense. And we, we still don't have machines that can do this. Um, so uh, one limitation of current, uh, most current AI systems is that they, they have a constant number of computational steps between input and output. That includes things like uh, autoregressive large language models that uh, a lot of people have heard, heard about in the last few months. There's a fixed amount of computation to compute um, every token, and that limits the reasoning ability of those, of those systems. They, they can't really plan either. They're autoregressive, so they produce things one after another. Um, so uh, how do we get machines to learn and act uh, more like, like humans and animals, particularly being able to reason and plan? So uh, let's talk about self-supervised learning first because it's really created the last uh, revolution in, uh, in AI and that's been announced for the last seven or eight years. I've been a, a big proponent of this. Um, uh, self-supervised learning is the idea that you capture the internal dependencies between, uh, uh, within a signal by basically training a machine to predict. So if you were to train a machine to uh, predict video, you would show a, a video clip and then you would reveal the the, the next segment of the video and then train the system <coughs> to attempt to pr uh, predict what's going to happen next. Um, the masking doesn't need to be about the future, it could be about the past, it could be different parts of the input, okay, but it's essentially take an input, mask a piece of it, and then from the piece that is visible try to uh, capture the dependency with a piece that is not visible, or not currently visible. Um, and that, that works astonishingly well for things like natural language understanding. So every top NLP system over the last four, five years or so um, has been trained uh, the following way, or pre-trained the following way. You take, a, you take a text, you corrupt it by hiding some of the, some of the words, 10 to 15 percent of, uh, of the words, by replacing them by a blank marker or substituting them for another one. And then you train some gigantic neural net, generally a transformer architecture, to predict the words that are missing. Um, and in the process of doing so, the system learns internal representations of text that uh, represent anything about the, the syntax, the semantics, the meaning, everything, the style. Um, and you can furthermore train those systems to be multi, uh, multilingual. So you don't have to train them in a single language, you can pre-train them with multiple languages, and those systems find some sort of internal representation that is language independent, which is kind of baffling, um, but it works amazingly well. And as I said, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, those things have been used in production, very widely uh, uh, deployed over the last uh, four or five years. And this is what has uh, allowed uh, companies like, uh, like, like Meta, you know, in Facebook and YouTube and, and others um, to do content moderation much more efficiently, detecting things like hate speech. It used to be that the proportion of hate speech that was automatically detected was on the order of 30% about five years ago. Now it's 95. And it's just because of this. Uh, translation systems, they work really well now. It's because of this. Um, so, incredible revolution. 
Um, and you know, those systems have been used also for, for generating, uh, gener uh, generating content, either text, uh, images, videos, etc. cetera. Um, and for this, it's a special case of what I described, uh, which um, the, the masking that you perform is, is not, you, you don't mask sort of random words in the text, you just mask the last, the last one. Okay, so you train a gigantic neural net to just predict the last word in a long sequence of a few thousand words uh, taken from a corpus. Um, and you train this uh, system on, I don't know, a thousand to two thousand trillion words. And uh, with neural nets that have, uh, there are transformer architectures uh, with a particular uh, style of uh, connections inside that makes them causal so they can uh, so these this neural nets can only pay attention to, of stuff that, that's in the past of whatever it is that they're predicting. Um, and uh, they may have on the order of billions uh, to a trillion parameters. Uh, and, and then when you use them, once they're trained, uh, you use them by producing the, the next word in a text. So you, you feed them a prompt, you ask them to produce the next word, and then you inject that word into the input by shifting everything else by one and then produce the next next word and then shift again, etc. So that's just autoregressive prediction, um, a very old concept, of course. And the amazing thing is that when you make those systems big enough, there's some sort of emergent uh, property that happens. They seem to not just understand, to some extent, the text that they're reading, but they can produce text that kind of makes sense, particularly if you fine tune them for a particular task, uh, like answering you know, certain questions uh, through human feedback. So, uh, there's a long history of uh, language models uh, of this type that predict the next word going back to Shannon. So it's not a new, a new idea. Uh, the first neural models to do next word prediction were by Yosha Benju in the mid 2000s. Um, and uh, you know what, what happened in the last few years is just scaling them up essentially and, and having access to more data. So um, there's a, a series of dialogue systems that have been uh, released by you know, various uh, companies or, or labs. Uh, uh, Blunderbot that was a couple of years ago, Galactica was uh, in uh, September last year. This was trained on the entire scientific literature for the uh, purpose of helping scientists write papers, all of us. Uh, it was released as a demo and it was murdered by Twitter. Um, so a lot of people on Twitter said, oh, this is horrible. People are going to use this to generate fake scientific paper. This is going to flood the peer review system and, you know, and society will be destroyed. And as a result, the people who created Galactica at, uh, at FAIR, it was a small team of, you know, five people, got so distraught that they took it down. Uh, and then the leadership at, at, uh, at, at Meta said, oh, this is too dangerous. We're not going to release anything like this again. So, uh, I mean, the reaction of the public on this, you know, ha can have very damaging effect mm -hmm. under the pretense of ethics. Um, it actually damages the progress of science. Um, so anyway, we have to be careful about this. Um, uh, then there is uh, the, the next thing that was released by, uh, by FAIR uh, very recently is a system called LAMA, which is open source. So this is a large language model, it was, you know, same, autoregressive. Um, there's several uh, sizes from 7 billion to 65 billion parameters. The 13 billion parameters uh, gives better results on benchmarks than the 175 billion parameter uh, GPT-3. Um, so this progress has been made. It's open source, the, the inference code is open source, but the model themselves are behind a, a firewall. You have to apply to get the, the weights of the network. And the reason for this, uh, and, and when you get them, you can't <coughs> use them commercially. And the reason for this is that those systems have been trained with lots and lots of data from everywhere on the internet. And a lot of people who provide this data are not happy that their data is used to train language model. And so if FAIR or, or Meta was to distribute this commercially, it would probably get sued by a whole bunch of people like Reddit and Twitter and whatever. Um, so no open source, no AI industry in the open source world because of legal issues. Again, people talk about ethics, but that's a big ethics question. Um, Alpaca was a system by Stanford that was basically a fine-tuned version of Llama. Uh, and then there are similar you know, systems at Google, at DeepMind, etc. cetera. Uh, huge teams working on this in all of those companies. And of course, everybody knows about ChatGPT for the only reason that it works pretty well. It's, it's been fine-tuned you know, for like a year and, or, or two. 
um, and uh, and it's available to the public. But in terms of underlying, you know, innovation of technique, not much. It's just you know, well engineered essentially. Uh, I said this on Twitter and also was accused of being <laughs> jealous or something. I don't know. Um, so the performance of those things is amazing. Um, they're very useful, particularly useful as writing aids. But they made really stupid mistakes. They made factual errors, logical errors. Um, they're really inconsistent, particularly for long uh, utterances. They have very limited reasoning. There's no way to control for toxicity, et cetera. It's, um, and they don't have any knowledge of the underlying reality. They're purely trained on text. And it may be surprising to many of us, but most of human knowledge has nothing to do with language. It's the knowledge of the physical world, or intuition, or even for mathematicians, right? If I ask a, a question, uh, I multiply a vector by a positive uh, semi-definite matrix. Uh, can the resulting vector um, form a, an angle larger than 90 degrees with, a, with the original vector? And all of, all of you here, most of you <laughs> at least, I'm sure, all of you have some mental model of what a positive <laughs> semi-definite matrix does to a vector and realize that it only stretches the uh, you know, the axes and they can't possibly rotate a vector by more than 90 degrees. Or you maybe remember a theorem that says that, you know, uh, a, uh, a quadratic form, you know, produces a positive number. Um, regardless, but you have a mental model that you use, right, for, uh, because of intuition. Those systems have no mental model or whatever mental model they have is purely built from text and very shallow in its, uh, um, in its understanding of, uh, of the world. Uh, no intuition. Uh, but they can't remember the theorem. Um, so uh, it's very useful for, to use those things to generate text, particularly for text that is very organized, like, like code. So uh, this is going to revolutionize the way software is being written. Uh, this is some code that's being uh, generated uh, with the Lama 65 billion, uh, this, this open source thing. And you just specify this, finds the real root of blah, 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 and the sequence just writes the code. Or, write a regular expression to remove HTML tags in Python string, etc. So short code that, write, that, that works really well. Entire software, no, because those systems can't plan, they can't really kind of organize uh, data structures and stuff, but they get, they'll, they'll write code for one page or something. Uh, but they, ha they hallucinate. So my colleagues make a joke on me. Did you know that Ian Logan dropped a rap album last year? We listened to it and here is what we thought. And, and the system just continues <laughs> and sort of makes up a story for, um, you know, I put out a rap album. Um, I actually don't like rap particularly. I'm more kind of a jazz person. So I asked them to do the same thing with jazz and they say, no, it doesn't work because there's not enough jazz review on, online. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I cried. Um, Okay, so what are they good for? They're good for, uh, as, a, as a writing aid, certainly, uh, writing assistance, first charge gener generation, statistic <coughs> polishing, uh, which is really good for the many of us who are not native English speakers. Um, they're not good for producing factual and consistent, consistent answers. They hallucinate. Uh, taking into account recent information, they're, they're trained with uh, data that's two years old, essentially. Um, behaving properly, um, they just, you know, respect the statistics of the data, and that really, really depends on what they've been trained on. They don't do reasoning, they don't do planning, they don't do math. Um, they could be using tools, such as search engine calculators, database queries, etc. People are working on this actively, but, but ChatGPT doesn't do this. Okay? Uh, but it's a very active topic of research. We're easily fooled by their fluency into thinking that they are smart, but they're not. Um, and they don't know how the world works. And here is a little bit of kind of folk math about it. Um, let's imagine that um, you know, the, the sequence of tokens that such a model can produce, you can organize them in a tree, okay? a tree of all the possible, you know, for every first token, uh, you know, there's a, a number of uh, different paths that correspond to like 100,000 or something, correspond to all the words in the, in the dictionary, and that for each of those, you have a thousand different words, et cetera. So they organize as a tree. The set of correct answers, however you define that, is a subtree within that tree. And let's imagine, uh, for the sake of simplicity, there is some probability E for uh, every token being generated to take you out of the tree of correct answers. Okay, assuming the errors are independent, which of course is false, uh, the probability that a, a sequence of tokens of size n 
is within the set of, of correct answers is uh, 1 minus e to the power n. It's a diffusion process with exponential divergence. <coughs> Which means there's no way in hell those things can work well. Like, no way. Um, this exponential de decaying, the only thing you can, you can play with at the moment, which is what a lot of people are essentially boi boiling small lakes to do, is to make this E smaller. Okay? But you can't fix the fact that it's an uh, exponentially di diverging uh, diffusion process. Um, so this is not fixable without a major de redesign, and that's <coughs> what I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, so that's not the only problem that those things have. Um, they have a constant number of computational steps between input and output for each token, uh, which sort of, and they have sort of weak representation power. Uh, they don't really reason and they do not plan. I made that point before. Um, and, uh, you know, they're missing a lot of characteristics of human and animal uh, intelligence. So they, they, they suck. All right. I mean, they're very useful. They're going to create a new industry. They're going to revolutionize the, word, the world. But they suck. Um, so, how do humans and animals learn so quickly? Um, we learn uh, a lot of things about how the world works in the first few months of life, mostly by observation, and then after we learn how to use our limbs with interaction. Uh, but at first, it's mostly observation. So we learn really basic concepts like uh, the fact that the world is three-dimensional, the fact that when an object disappears behind another one, it still exists. Uh, the fact that uh, there are categories of objects in the world, even if we don't know their names, we know that you know, there are different spontaneous categories. And then around the age of nine months, we learn about things like gravity, that objects are supposed to fall if they're not supported. Inertia, you know, intuitive physics, right? That takes a while. Uh, you take a, you put a, I don't know, a eight month old on a high chair with some uh, toys on the, on the table in front, in front of him. Uh, it's going to systematically put them on the floor, like, you know, and watch, right? Because that's the experiment that gravity actually works, right? Um, but then, how is it that, uh, you know, babies can learn how the world works like this? Uh, how is it that by the, by the age of uh, 16 or 17, a teenager can learn to drive a car with 20 hours of practice or something like that? And we still don't have self-driving cars. Um, you know, we may have ChatGPT or GPT-4 or whatever it is, <coughs> Uh, but we don't have robots that can, you know, clear the dinner table and fill the dishwasher, even though a 10-year-old is capable of it. Um, so this is a new example of the, the Moravec uh, paradox, which is that computers can do stuff that seem complicated for humans, but can't do the simple stuff that humans take for granted. Um, it's, still, it's still with us. Um, so perhaps the accumulation of the background knowledge that babies learn when they watch the spectacle of the world is, uh, is, the, is what constitutes the, the basis of common sense. And so I, I see three challenges for AI and machine learning research going forward. The first one is learning representations and predictive models of the world. That's going to use self-supervised learning, a form of self-supervised learning. Learning to reason in ways that are compatible with, you know, neural nets, essentially. And learning to plan complex action sequences because that's one of the essence of, uh, of intelligence. So, um, I've made a proposal, I wrote a, a long paper, uh, quite readable for wide uh, audiences, not very technical, that I put on open review so people can make comments and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, it's called The Path Towards Autonomous Machine Intelligence. Um, I gave various technical talks about it, um, a, a bit longer than this one. And, um, and here is the story. Uh, the, the paper has been online since uh, before the summer, so this predates, you know, the chat GPT and everything. So uh, it's based on the idea that uh, an intelligent system should have some sort of uh, what's called a cognitive architecture, some organization. And the, what I'm proposing here is uh, basically built around this idea of world model. So a world model is the mental model that we have of some reality that we're dealing with that allows us to predict how the world is going to evolve, uh, particularly how the state of the world is going to change as a consequence of actions we might take. Uh, because if we have such a model that allows us to plan a sequence of actions to arrive at a particular outcome. Uh, the entire purpose of the system is to minimize some in, uh, internal costs. And when I say minimize, I don't mean minimize by learning, I mean minimize by acting. So the system figures out a sequence of actions that according to its internal predictive world model uh, will arrive at a state 
where its internal cost is minimized. Uh, and once it's planned, the sequence of action, it just outputs the first action or group of action in the world and then uh, gets the estimate of the state of the world back and then repeats the process. So this is a planning, very similar to kind of classical uh, planning in, uh, in um, optimal control. So there's two ways to use an um, architecture of this type. The first one is reactive. Um, similar to what Daniel Kahneman, uh, famous psychologist, called System 1, which is sort of subconscious action, if you want, where you perceive the world, extract some internal representation of the state of the world through a perception system, and then directly run this through uh, some neural net that produces an action. So this is just, you know, reacting, essentially. Autoregressive LLM are of this type. Um, the, the world to them is a window of previous words, that have been entered uh, to them or they have produced, and they just produce the next word, right? It's just uh, direct. Um, but here is mode two. So mode two is, uh, or is considerably more sophisticated, and this is really what hum humans and many animals do. Um, you perceive the world, you uh, run this with an encoder that gives you some sort of representation of the estimated state of the world, whatever is perceived at the moment. And then uh, you run this through a, the world model, which is here uh, represented by this predictor. And the world of a predictor is from the state of the world at time t and uh, an action you might take, what would be the state of the world at time t plus one? Okay, so you can hypothesize a sequence of actions that you imagine in your head, you predict the result, and then that goes into some cost function that measures to what extent you've satisfied the task that you want to accomplish. This is very classical model predictive control from uh, optimal control, except here we're going to learn this model uh, and you know, the cost function may be complicated and the optimization problem of finding the sequence of actions to minimize the cost may be highly non-convex. Uh, we're gonna have all kinds of problems. Uh, I'm not specifying what method we use to do this inference at this point. You can use whatever you, you think is appropriate. Um, the several models that have been proposed along, the, along this, uh, this line, mostly for robotics uh, control, not in the context of uh, NLP or anything like that. Um, but those systems can plan. They plan ahead, right? They have an objective they have to satisfy, and they plan a sequence of actions or a sequence of words, if it's a dialogue system, to arrive at this, uh, at this objective, to satisfy this objective. This is not autoregressive. So my prediction, which may be wrong, is that within five years, absolutely no one in their right, mi right mind would be using autoregressive LLMs. They would probably use something like this. Because you can correct for hallucination, you can correct for toxicity, you can correct for all kinds of stuff by designing those cost functions in appropriate ways. Um, okay. Okay, so how do we build and train the world model? We're gonna use uh, self-supervised learning, but there is an issue. Self-supervised learning works really well for text. And the reason it works well for text is that although you can never predict exactly what word uh, appears in a particular text that if you don't see that word, you can easily produce a, a prob probability distribution over all the words in your dictionary and, and basically manage uncertainty in the prediction this way, right? So if I say the, the cat chases the blank in the kitchen, the blank you know, could be a mouse or something, uh, but it's not necessarily a mouse, it could be, I don't know, a laser pointer dot or something. So, um, so the system can produce a probability distribution over words and get away with uh, dealing with uncertainty this way. If you're going to do video prediction, um, we don't have a way to properly represent distributions over all video frames, and certainly not over all video clips. Um, so we're gonna have to cut some corners, okay? to deal with uncertainty in uh, prediction in continuous spaces. This is the reason, the main reason why we're, we, we don't have at the moment uh, uh, self-supervised learning systems that are trained from video and can learn how the world works on video because we don't know how to deal with that problem. Or at least we have ideas, but you know, there's still some work. So, uh, oh, there's a delay. Okay, so this is a system that was trained to predict the trajectories of cars from a, a top-down video on a highway. And if you train a, a neural net to make this kind of prediction, you get those blurry prediction. Same here. It's blurry because if you ask the system to make one prediction, the only thing it can do is predict the average of all the possible outcome. Um, and that's not a good prediction. So you have to find some ways of representing uncertainty. And uh, my solution to this 
is to abandon the whole idea of generative models, okay? Um, and uh, a generative model, you know, takes, so let's say you want to capture the dependencies between X and Y, X being, for example, the initial segment of a video, and Y being the continuation of it. Run X to an encoder, uh, run the representation to a predictor, and then measure the reconstruction error. That's a generative model. The problem with this is that there may be a huge number of details in Y that are completely irrelevant to any task you might imagine. Um, in this room, the precise texture of the carpet is irrelevant. There's no way you can remember it, actually, right? Uh, or, um, um, I mean, you know, the position of every hair on everybody's head or something. Uh, it's irrelevant to any task you'll ever care about. And so you don't want a generative model because a generative model will have to actually model all those details if you have it reconstruct pixels. Otherwise, it's going to make a reconstruction error. So what I'm proposing is something called a joint embedding architecture. Uh, and this is based uh, on experimental uh, results, the reason why we want to use this. So you take X and Y, run both of them through <coughs> encoders, and then you do the prediction in the space of representations extracted from those encoders. Uh, there's a slight issue with this, which is that if you train a system like this, uh, overall, you train the encoder and the predictor simultaneously, to minimize the prediction error, it's going to collapse. It's going to ignore x and y, set sx and xy to constants, and then make this prediction error, this uh, prediction, just the identity function, or some fixed function, right? Um, not even a function, it just needs to, you know, map the single sx to the single sy that is constant. So, uh, so that doesn't work. Uh, and so in fact, there are several uh, flavors of this uh, joint embedding architecture, kind of a simple one that we used to call Siamese networks, um, uh, sort of predictive models like this, and in predictive models where you can have a latent variable here that represents the fact that uh, the prediction of SY from SX may, may not be deterministic, so you need to parameterize the set of possible SY using a latent variable that can vary over a set or being or, or is drawn from a distribution. Um, so that's the joint embedding predictive architecture. And, um, and to train those things, we have to abandon probability theory. <laughs> okay. so, um, so I asked you to abandon generative models and now probability theory. Uh, we have to, be, uh, to use the weaker form of uh, how we capture dependencies between, uh, between variables, which is uh, energy-based model. So energy-based model is if you have two variables, x and y, you want to capture the dependencies between them. It's, it suffices to uh, produce a function that takes low values on the uh, manifold of data, where you have data points, and then higher values outside. Okay? If you have a function of this type, it captures the dependency between x and y. You don't need anything else. If you want you know, probabilistic prediction, low density, you may have some trouble, but just capturing dependency, this is sufficient. Uh, and it's a good way of uh, uh, representing what goes on in one of those uh, joint embedding systems. You basically want to train the system, in fact, I'm going to go here. You want to train the system to uh, take low energy, produce a, a low reconstruction energy or prediction energy or whatever it is, uh, on data points that you train it on, and then higher energy outside. There's two classes of methods for this, contrastive methods that are still being popular, and I kind of invented them a while back for joint embedding architectures, but I, I've become very uh, skeptical about them these days, because I don't think they scale very well with the dimension of the representation space, but that consists in generating contrastive points and pushing their energy up while you take the data points and you push their energy down. Uh, but what I prefer now is uh, what I call regularized methods, and the regularized method basically try to minimize the volume of space that can take low energy. So whenever you push down the energy of certain regions, energy of other regions have to go up because there is a limited supply of low energy space, if you want. Um, and uh, we, without, uh, so I ask you to abandon generative models, abandon probabilistic models, abandon contrastive methods, which are kind of popular, and also abandon reinforcement learning, which I've been saying for 10 years. Um, and so these are the pillars of machine learning at the moment, and uh, I'm not making any friends. Um, okay, uh, so this regularized method, there is a way to make them work and uh, to prevent the system from collapsing, essentially. And the basic idea is that you find some measure of the information content of the representation that comes out of the encoder, and you try to maximize it, okay? So if you have an objective function for training, 
it measures the negative uh, information of Sx and Sy, and you, you minimize it. Um, other details I'm going to skip. One way to do this is, uh, uh, so, so to prevent the, the system from just producing constant vectors, one way to prevent this from happening is you put a, a cost function on the standard deviation of each variable coming out of, uh, of the encoder. You take each variable and you say, over a batch of samples, I want the variance to be at least one, which you can implement with a cost function of this type. It's basically a hinge loss on the standard deviation. Now, the, the system can cheat and just decide that all the variables are equal, right? So it's not very informative. Um, so to, do, to uh, get rid of that problem, you minimize the off-diagonal covariance terms of, uh, of those things. And so basically, you're trying to make the covariance matrix uh, of those, those vectors uh, close to identity. Um, and there are other people who have had this idea uh, in a similar way, Yiba, for example, with uh, uh, method equals MTR squared. Um, but that is not sufficient because the system can still cheat by making the components of SX uncorrelated but still dependent. And so there's a trick here, which uh, we have some theory for, but not entirely, which is to uh, 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 insert a, a neural net here that expands the dimension of SX into a bigger vector. And you train this, this network simultaneously with everything else, and you apply the variance covariance criterion to this uh, uh, to the output of this. And that tends to make the components of SX more independent. But you have to realize that we're, what we're doing here is that we're pushing up on an upper bound on information content, hoping that the actual information will follow. Uh, and that's because we don't have lower bounds on information measure. Um, yeah, so this is some theory that shows that the variables of, SY, of SX or SY become independent. So then we can test those systems by you know, training them with a bunch of, for example, if you want to train them to do uh, image recognition, you show them uh, two distorted versions of the same image, and you tell the system whatever representation you extract should be the same because um, this is really the same image with the same content. So you pre-train the system. You don't need any labels for this. You just need to have a way of distorting the image. Uh, and then you feed ImageNet to it, and you train a, a, a linear classifier or a very simple classifier on the top. You don't fine tune the, uh, the, the trunk, and, and you measure the performance. And this works really well. So you, you can train systems to get like, really good performance in the mid 70s or so with SSL by pre training on ImageNet and then fine tuning on, on, on ImageNet uh, with labels. Uh, uh, if you use a, a bigger uh, training set, I'm not going to bore you with details. Um, there's variations of this uh, method, VCREG, uh, which means variance, invariance, covariance, regularization, for, to train systems to do uh, uh, image segmentation, not just uh, classification, so as to learn local features. And then another technique that came out of uh, uh, FAIR as well, uh, called uh, iJEPA. So this used uh, this uh, JEPA architecture with predictors. And it basically, the basic idea of it is that you train the, the, the neural net to predict um, certain areas of the representations of the image from other areas. So you mask a piece of the input image, you run through, you get a representation, and from whatever representation you get, you train the system to predict the representation that is produced from the full image. This works really well, like amazingly well, it's very fast, um, and it beats other computing methods for self-supervised learning. Again, I'm not going to bore you with details. Um, there's some theory which I'm going to skip. There is a theoretical paper here that uh, you might ha want to have a look at. It just came out in the last few days uh, that I co-authored with uh, Ravid uh, Schwarzziv, who is a postdoc at NYU, on some sort of information bottleneck approach to explaining how self-supervised learning and supervised learning and supervised learning uh, work uh, based on information theory results. Um, OK, I'm, co I'm coming to the end. Uh, <laughs> OK, so one reason we might want to train a JEPA is, is that if we have a JEPA, we can use this architecture as a predictive world model that we could use in an intelligent system capable of planning. So imagine that we have an observation about the state of the world here. We feed it an action. This predictor may predict a representation of the next state of the world, okay, which we can then fine tune if we actually observe the next state of the world. And we can sort of back propagate uh, gradients to adjust the system. Um, so that would be for like single level planning. But really what people do when we plan a, an action or a sequence of action, we plan hierarchically. 
So what we want is some sort of more abstract representation of, of the world that would allow us to make longer term predictions in this more abstract uh, representation that may have fewer details about, about how the world works. Uh, so it's called hierarchical JEPA, which could make a prediction at multiple level, uh, multiple levels. We actually have some experiments about something like this, which actually has some connection with uh, wavelet transform. But I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details because I don't have time. Uh, but it, it's a system that basically is trained from video uh, and is simultaneously try to learn to predict the representation of future frames from, from previous frames and also learn representations that would be appropriate for image recognition. Uh, it's a pretty complex architecture, so I'm not going to explain how it works. Um, but, but here is, um, in the end, the architecture you might want to use if you are able to train a hierarchical JEPA. Uh, you observe the state of the world, run this to an encoder, um, run this to another encoder and yet another encoder, and then you get a very abstract high-level representation of the state of the world. Um, and perhaps the, the task you want to go here is, you want to do is, uh, I don't know, go from here to New York City. Okay, <laughs> so my cost function is my distance to New York City. Okay, uh, computed from the state predicted by this predictor. The first action I have to do is go to the airport and then catch a plane. So to, to New York, right? How do I go to the airport? Um, so I have to take an action, of course, to go to the airport, some macro action like uh, they can represent by this latent variable z. But basically here, I represent the state of being to the airport and this cost function now for the lower level below is how far from the airport am I? How far from Charles de Gaulle am I? Uh, I first need to call a taxi, taxi is here, and then tell the taxi to go to the airport and that will take me to the airport. How do I uh, catch a taxi if I'm in Paris, let's say? So this is whether I'm in, in, a, in a taxi or, more, or, no, or not. First, I need to get out on the street and hail a taxi, which actually has a low probability of succeeding in Paris. <laughs> but, um, okay, so now, uh, but in fact, this is not the lowest level. The lowest level is millisecond by millisecond muscle control, right? So there is a very deep hierarchy of such things, right? So, um, as I was saying, uh, intelligent uh, tasks, and, and you might think that uh, humans are the only animals capable of doing this. No, your cat does that. Um, your cat, if it wants to jump over the, this uh, blackboard, uh, we'll go here and then look around, move its head, and, and then jump here, jump here, and jump here, and figure it out. Uh, this is pretty complex planning. Requires very accurate world model. So cats have world models, LLMs don't. Um, I don't need this. Um, so, so that's the, the challenge of AI for the next few years, um, figuring, out, figuring out how to make our supervised learning work for video, handling uncertainty in prediction, probably using joint embedding architecture, perhaps using energy-based model framework, uh, learning world models from observation, and then using this to plan and, and, and reason. Um, and you know, we can ask the question, once we figure this out, will we will have machines that are as intelligent as humans and animals? And the answer is perhaps. You know, this may not be the only required um, uh, component, but, um, but, but you know, that, that, that would be uh, uh, part of the story. Um, you know, questions people are asking themselves, maybe not in a serious uh, company like here, but, um, but a lot of people are asking themselves those questions now. Uh, are saying, you know, ChatGPT, GPT-4, they seem to have superhuman intelligence, they can do stuff that, might, you know, most people can't do, etc. Uh, but it's easy to get fooled. They're not that smart and they certainly don't understand how the world works. But there is no question that at some point, we're going to reach, we're going to have machines that are more intelligent than humans in all domains where humans are intelligent. There's no question about this in my mind. Um, and uh, it's not going to be general intelligence like, like a lot of people refer to, um, because human intelligence is actually very specialized. We, th we like to think of ourselves as having general intelligence. We don't. We're incredibly specialized. Um, so I, I prefer to talk about human level AI rather than AGI. Um, but before we get to human level AI, we're gonna, probably going to have to go through like cat level AI maybe or dog level AI. Um, there's a joke like before we get to God level AI, we need to get to dog level AI. Um, uh, and it won't happen tomorrow. It's probably going to take a while, but it's clear that progress is accelerating because there's a lot of uh, you know, business interest behind this. Thank you.
running a little over, so do we have time for one question? There is a uh, there is a roboticist, uh, Hod Lipson, who is mm -hmm. teaching these machines that have been randomly wired to walk or something like this. Uh, right. How is it related? Yeah, Rod Lipson is a Columbia. He um, uh, he's using reinforcement learning. So this is one of the things I, I, I say we should not use, or at least minimize its use. So I think the purpose of reinforcement learning research should be to minimize the use of reinforcement learning. <laughs> the reason being that reinforcement learning is so inefficient in terms of, of data, right? I mean, we, we all hear about you know, AlphaGo and uh, you know, the success of reinforcement learning for game playing and things like that, uh, including also for poker playing and, and uh, uh, even diplomacy. Um, but, uh, but those systems require enormous amounts of, uh, of trials. Um, uh, the, the, the number of games that are played by AlphaGo to train itself to reach uh, superhuman performance or, or human level performance is uh, on the order of, orders of millions of games. And it's, you know, it's, it's, in, it's insane. So your proposal is that it will do it faster. Yeah. Uh, that said, uh, Go is a very difficult task for humans. That's why it's an it's a interesting game. It's because it's hard for humans. And it turns out humans suck at this. I mean, machines are much, much better at, at this type of, you know, uh, uh, basically arborescent uh, planning uh, and sort of comm combinatorial uh, search than, than humans who have very limited short-term memory and kind of slow, uh, uh, slow, slow brains, right? So. Um, so the best Go players in the world before AlphaGo thought they were maybe two or three stones handicapped, you know, below God, uh, the ideal Go player. And it turns out, no, humans just are so bad. I mean, it's like a nine, nine stones behind. It's like a beginner, com you know, compared to an uh, uh, expert, expert player. Um, we're really, really bad at this, which is why it's not that hard in the end for computers to be better than us. We're just bad at it. Right. That was a question. Yeah, I mean, you draw a pass uh, cat dog before arriving uh, at human. Or on the other hand, we thought that the main difference between uh, humans and uh, uh, animals was language. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you have these chat GPT and uh, uh, systems that reproduce it, and much more than language, the ability to reproduce proof, even if doesn't understand and so on. So there may be other paths to intelligence. And, and, and uh, what is surprising <laughs> is what you define as the, 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 the difficulty is not what is the difficulty uh, in the, um, is what animals have, mm -hmm. what we thought was not difficult. Yeah. So there is something a bit strange here, which is not just the business as usual. Okay. And th so that's my first question. You, and the second one is just more technical, is uh, you've been pushing towards these energy models to abandon in the, in all the constraints of probabilities. On the other hand, in the new pro uh, proposal that you are having, you are pushing normalizations and so on. So it has a bit flavors of back to probabilities. No. No, and that's what I want to understand. No, no, no. Uh, because you can't, uh, it, it, with the joint embedding prob uh, architectures, the, the Y variable, that you, the, which is the one you're supposed to predict, if you have a probabilistic approach, you're supposed to uh, basically identify P of Y given X, right, in a prediction framework. Uh, but the Y variable now goes to an encoder. So to compute P of Y given X, you will have to invert this encoder. Problem is that this encoder is not uh, invertible because there's many Ys that will produce the same representation. That's kind of the whole point of this approach, which is that the encoder that looks at Y will eliminate all kinds of irrelevant information so that the, the invariant space, if you want, for a given representation, the input space of Y that produces that representation is an entire manifold. But when you have a probability distribution, you have a Gibbs energy which forgets about the irrelevance and you still re can reproduce a sample textures and so, fields and so on. Okay, so you can, you can, you can take the prediction energy um, and take, you know, do e to the minus its energy and normalize. You can't normalize, your integral does not converge because the, the space of, of y, uh, you know, for, for a, a given level of, of energy is as, you know, non-zero volume or whatever. 
Um, so you can normalize, you can invert that function. I mean, there's no way you can turn this into a, a probabilistic model, so you have to abandon the whole idea. And what about the first question? Okay, so the first question is, uh, is interesting and relevant. Um, there is a lot of, uh, we, we, we are biased uh, uh, as humans to think that most of the knowledge that we have is, is language based. And as I said, it's not true. Most of human knowledge is actually non-linguistic. Um, you could say that, um, so um, think about like, the quantity of data that something like uh, a large language model like Lama is trained on, uh, 1400 billion uh, tokens. If you had uh, a human read for eight hours a day at normal speed, uh, this would take 22,000 years to read. <laughs> okay, so obviously those things work, but to work they need to be trained on enormous amounts of data, right? Which humans don't seem to be requiring. So we're obviously able to extract a lot more about the underlying uh, uh, structure of the world and reality with considerably less uh, data. The, the total amount of video frames or the equivalent that uh, a five-year-old has seen during his life is less than a billion. It's, you know, you can get that in a few hours of YouTube. It, it, it's really not that much data in the end. So, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we learn this that, that quickly? Um, now you could say that, you know, the genome encodes a lot into our, our linguistic abilities and that's what kind of makes us intelligent. But then you realize that, uh, you know, chimps don't have language. Their genome is 99% identical to human. And when you quantify this, the, the genomic uh, difference between humans and chim chimpanzees can be stored in eight megabytes. Um, you're not, uh, you know, to store a large language model like a 65 billion, you need, you need uh, I mean, you can store it with 16 bit, but it's, it's still 130 gigabytes, right? So, uh, Language is an epiphenomenon. It only appeared in the last couple hundred years. Uh, it's been really useful to uh, the human species, but it's basically handled by, understanding language is handled by the Wernicke area, which is uh, a little p piece of brain about this big, right here. And production is the Borca area, which is right here, also this big. Um, that's what LLMs do. What they're missing is the prefrontal cortex. This is what makes us smart, okay, and also animals. <laughs> 